Hey y'all, welcome to my channel. My name is Saki, and today I'm gonna share with you a special DIY where I hack one of my favorite patterns to make a poofy sleeve shirred dress. You can use this technique to turn any fitted knit pattern into a pattern for shirred wovens. When I came across this fabric in Portland over the holidays, I knew it had to be turned into this dress concept. It's so rare to find different types of fabric in the same print, so I jumped at it and I bought a whopping yard of each. The fabrics are an X designer print, a cotton poplin, and a semi-sheer cotton gauze from Mill End. Unfortunately, they don't have an online store, but I'll still link them down below. If you're ever in Portland, it's definitely worth a visit. After doing some sleuthing, I found the fabric in Rebecca Taylor's Spring Summer 2019 Ready to Wear line, and further sleuthing led me to the whole range in this fabric called Emerald Daisy. The only baffling part is that I couldn't find a single garment that used the gauze version of the fabric. Since I'm not copying a Rebecca Taylor design, it didn't really matter, but I'm always curious to see how other designers use fabrics. Feeling a fabric in your hand and seeing how it behaves in a garment is one way to expand your knowledge base of what works where without actually having to experience it yourself. Okay, first step. I sketched out a rough idea and outline of what I'm actually looking to make. The basic design is a poofy sleeve with a bodycon style dress. While it's basically impossible to achieve a bodycon dress with a woven by itself, I can essentially turn my woven into a stretchy material by shirring it. The sleeves will be in a semi-sheer cotton gauze and the bodice will be made of the cotton poplin. I'll be using the Friday Pattern Company Adrian Blouse pattern, which I'll link below since it fits the base design I'm looking to emulate. But since it's a knit pattern, I'll need to hack it so that it'll work with a shirred fabric quick to-do list of what needs to be done. Redraft the bodice piece to one and a half times the width that it already is to make room for the shirring. Lengthen the bodice so that it hits above the knee and straighten the neckline for a couple of reasons. One, a curved neckline would be harder to shirr and finish, and two, it'll let me use a folded facing, which will eliminate the need for the neckband altogether. Then to drape, just to make sure that the proportions that I'm trying to make actually looks good in the fabric that I'm using. When I shirr fabrics, I typically do it in a double layer to add a bit of structure. But in this case, I almost definitely won't have enough to double up on. I'll have to dig through my stash later to see if I can find something suitable to act as the lining. All right, and now into the washing machine it goes. So we are on day two and I've decided to add um, kind of a ruffle to the top of the, um, the bodice. Fabric is dry and ready to be cut into and I just have to hack the pattern before I get started. The only piece that needed to be hacked was the bodice piece and since this pattern uses the same piece for both the front and the back, it made it pretty easy. The first time I tried to hack the bodice piece to be one and a half times wider, I started measuring the added width from the side seams towards the center front. Honestly, it was just the side that was closest to me at the time, and I just started working without really thinking it through. Um, things got really confusing for me when I realized that my center front was not lining up with itself. I actually stood baffled for a good 10 minutes, staring at it, wondering why things weren't working out the way I wanted. I kind of thought for a second reality was trying to punk me or something. Okay, now actually we're on day three <laughs> because yesterday I ran out of a memory on my SD cards, which meant that I spent the whole day uploading photos and deleting them and figuring out what the yeah. I'm doing with my life. Anyway, I'm here, I'm back, and we're going to hack the pattern today and also hopefully get to cutting fabric and um, I'm probably asking for way too much but sewing. <laughs> After I figured out what I was doing wrong, I started over, but this time with the math already figured out for me. I chose the most inner and outer points of the pattern piece and multiplied their width from the center fold by one and a half. One and a half is the general standard for adding width for shirring, so if you're following along at home in a different size, the math is pretty straightforward. I expanded the neckline out from four and a half inches to six and three quarters, the underarm point from seven and a half to eleven and a quarter, the waist from six and three quarters to 10 and an eighth, and the hip 
hips from 9 inches to 13.5. I did not expand any measurements vertically since shoring only provides stretch in one direction and we wouldn't need it. I used a French curve to kind of emulate the original curve and drew lines to make all of these points meet. In retrospect, I could have done without the curve in at the true waist. Shoring fabrics kind of makes it so that all these little specifics, like a couple inches here and there, the difference between the waist and the bust just doesn't matter. Further, these deep curves of the hips could have been turned into a shallower curve, which would have made things a little easier for my future self when it came time to shoring. To square the neckline, I drew a straight line from the high neckline point where the bodice connects to the sleeve piece to the center front, making sure it hit the center fold at a right angle. I added 13 inches to the length of the bodice to make it hit above the knee. Before I start cutting, I iron the cotton poplin smooth. This helps to keep the grain straight and even while cutting. <laughs> Because of the crinkly nature of the gauze, I opted not to iron it. Aside from seersuckers and other non-permanent textured fabrics, whether you should iron crinkly fabrics before cutting is one of those things that comes down to whether or not you plan on ironing the garment before you wear it in the future. If you iron it pre-cutting, it'll crinkle back up after washing and shrink per se. To obtain that intended fullness again, you'd have to iron it each time you wash it. I am um, no shame try to keep my ironing limited to the sewing room, so that's why I opted not to iron it before cutting. Then we're off to the cutting table. I only had two pattern pieces to cut, two sleeves in the gauze, two bodices in the poplin, and two in a lining. I dug through my stash to find some lining fabric and found this silk cotton blend that I picked up at Fabric Depot in Portland for $2 a yard before they went out of business. Real talk, I bought all that they had on hand, which was something like 11 yards, but I hate it. It curls up when you cut it and and it's hard to achieve a straight bias, so I only use it for projects like this where striving for perfection is a waste of time. Okay, now we're ready to sew. This pattern comes with a 5 8 inch inseam, even though it's a pattern for knits, which seriously makes me jump for joy. I prefer to use different finishes rather than a surged edge, and that extra bit of inseam makes it easier for me to do that. Let's work on the sleeves first. I sewed a scant 1 8 inch basting stitch along the top edge of the sleeve, then use that stitch line as a full guide to press that edge towards the wrong side of the sleeve. I then used a seam guide to fold another half inch towards the wrong side and pinned it in place. I used my edge stitch foot to help me stitch right along the edge of the fold, creating the casing for the shoulder elastic to live in. I pressed this casing flat. Full disclosure, my elastic is 3 8 inch wide rather than the half inch suggested by the pattern. This allowed me to use the seam allowance already provided by the pattern instead of having to redraft it. Next, I attached a safety pin onto the end of a length of elastic and pulled it through the casing I just created. The pattern calls for an elastic 6 and a half inches wide, but on my last version it was way too short and made the shirt ride up way too high. I measured how long I'd rather have it so that the waist sits at my true waist and I got a 11 and a half inches. So I cut my elastic a bit short to 11 inches to allow the tension to keep my sleeves in place. I folded the sleeve right sides together, pinned the long underarm seams, and sewed them at 5 8 inch inseam. I pulled out my flea market treasure sleeve ironing board for this and pressed the seams towards the back, then prepped the seam for a flat pal finish. I'm setting the sleeves aside now to work on the bodice. I stitched the facing and outer fabric together at the neckline with a seam allowance of a quarter inch. I then sewed the two side seams with the right sides together at the normal seam allowance of 5 eighths of an inch on both the outer and the lining pattern pieces. And then I clipped the seams at the curves and trimmed it. Now folding the dress pieces at the neckline with the right sides together, I pinned the sleeve to the bodice at the underarm, butting up the top edge of the sleeve where the elastic lives with the fold of the neckline on the bodice. Think of it like a sleeve sandwich or a pita or something. The bodice is the pita with the outer fabric making up one side and the lining making up the other and the sleeve is all the goodies that goes inside the pita. Some people would probably sew two layers together with a basting stitch and then come in with the third once the first two are secure. But not me! I prefer to fiddle endlessly with super fiddly and unwieldy fabrics and elastics that are pulling things in all sorts of different directions. Super fun! But once I had it sewn together, I was able to flip everything right side out and model it briefly over my pre-existing outfit. Now I just have to hem the bottom and then I can start the shoring process. I flip the dress 
dress inside out again so that the right sides faced each other. And then I pinned the bottom, matching the side seams and making sure that the lining was one and a half inches longer than the outer fabric so that the lining would be shorter than the outer. This can also be achieved by simply cutting your lining one and a half inches shorter than your fashion fabric. Then I sewed along the outer fabric's edge with a quarter inch seam allowance, leaving a few inch gap along the bottom so I could pull everything back through it again and close it up from the outside. And yeah, I accidentally made myself a loop instead of a dress. So I dutifully got out my seam ripper, trimmed the excess seam allowance off of the lining and began unpicking this thing. But at this point I could tell my ADHD was kicking into overdrive because I started picking off the price tag on my seam ripper instead of actually fixing my mistake. My executive function bar had been completely depleted. So after I finished ripping that seam, I needed to call it a night. In the morning, I got straight to work without making a silly day five video. <laughs> I had been putting makeup on every day for the entire week just to film my face for a couple of minutes and I was over it. But a fresh start did me good because I was able to logic my way out of what went wrong. Here is the way to do it right. I flipped my dress so it's right side out again. I then folded the outer layer of the dress towards the wrong side and did the same with the lining, trying to emulate how the fabric would behave if it were already hemmed. I casually pinned it in place at several points, then went in between two of these pins and pulled the dress inside out. I fixed the pins so they're evenly and cleanly spaced and sewed the hem with a quarter inch seam allowance leaving a few inches gap to push the dress back through. Then I push the dress back through and I stitch the gap closed. Finally, I'm ready to start shirring. A lot of sources will tell you that shirring elastic should only be wound around the bobbin by hand, but I've actually never had a problem doing it by machine. You do have to go slow and guide the elastic so it's evenly spaced, but I find it a lot less tedious than winding by hand. I was curious though and experimented with the difference. When you wind by hand, you're able to wind the bobbin with without pulling on the elastic as you wind, which lets the elastic live on the bobbin in its resting state or unstretched. But when you wind via machine, you're pulling on the elastic as you wind, which makes it live on the bobbin in its active state, or in other words, stretched. This really can't be good for long-term storage, but I noticed no actual difference in terms of winding by machine and sewing immediately. If you know why it's better to wind by hand, please leave me a note down below because I would love to learn. I also tacked the lining and the dress together with pins along the side seams and at various points throughout the dress so that they can stay lined up as they sure. In hindsight, I just based or stitched this together because I got poked a lot and the pins didn't really stay in place like I wanted. There was a lot of manipulation as I went along. And to be totally honest, there are parts on the lining that bunch up quite a bit, but at the end of the day, it's just not noticeable and it doesn't really affect the wear or quality of the dress. So I'm not hung up on it. As a wise person once said, you gotta pick your battles. I've read some suggestions to draw lines with Taylor's chalk on your garment to mark where the shirring stitches should go, but marking the entire dress in chalk just felt like a hurdle I wouldn't be able to overcome. So I chose the route of just using the edge of my sewing machine foot as a guide for my next line. Even if I'm off by a millimeter or two here and there, my mistakes will average out over the course of the dress and it'll come out fine at the end. I did periodically measure my progress just to make sure I wasn't egregiously off track. The downside to using the edge of the sewing machine foot is that it spaces the shirring rows closer together at a quarter inch rather than an intentionally chosen distance like half an inch, which means more shirring in general. The upside to more shirring means more elastic and a tighter bodycon look. You win some, you lose some. When shirring the top of the dress, I stitched, pivoted with my needle down, stitched four stitches down to the next row, pivoted again, and continued to stitch back and forth in kind of a snake pattern until I reached where the underarm and the side seams meet. At that point, I could just start stitching in the round all the way down to the bottom of the dress without having to pivot. We're going downstairs to look in the big mirror. Alrighty, so this is what it looks like currently. Work from home slippers, big sleeves, the sleeve feel is gonna change pretty drastically when it is gathered up into itself. It'll actually, I can't do this with one hand. It'll raise it up quite a bit. I can't show you, sorry guys. <laughs> You'll see in like a few minutes cause videos are not that long. I am gonna finish the rest of this skirt. So the silhouette will be something more like this. 
and I think that it would benefit from a belt or something to cut it right at the natural waist. So that is now on the list as well. Um, so here's what I have left. I have uh, finished shirring. This amount so far has taken me like four hours. This will be another two hours of shirring. Pretty over it right now. Definitely listening to a lot of podcasts. Um, and then put the elastic in the sleeve so that it's gathered and then make a little belt to go along with it. But yeah, otherwise, super excited for this. Big sleeve moment. What is it? Big sleeve energy, B-S-E. I'm not really into this like lingo thing, so I don't know if I said that right or not. See you guys when this is done. Just a couple more hours of shirring left. I ended up using four spools of elastic thread for this dress. And finally, to finish the sleeve seam, I used the same technique as the top of the sleeve where I stitched a basting stitch of an eighth of an inch along the bottom to use as a guide for folding towards the wrong side. Then I used my seam guide to fold and pin half an inch toward the wrong side and the edge stitched, leaving a gap of an inch or so to get my elastic into the casing. After pulling the elastic through the casing, I stitched the elastic to itself to make a loop and I stitched the casing shut. Okay, at this point, if I got good b-roll, I'd tell you all about how this is my favorite part of shirring fabric. That magical moment when you steam it and everything shrinks up into itself is somehow the most satisfying part of spending five hours monotonously shirring the same piece of fabric over and over again in the round. Seriously, folks, it's the thing that drove me to actually finish this project when I was in the depths of shirring boredom. Like, I couldn't wait to steam it. And if I didn't get that b-roll, well, maybe it's worth including this anyway. And now that the dress is done, let's quickly pull together that belt I was talking about. I have some leftover leather strapping from making the pulls for these drawers, which I'll use this leather punch on, some screw rivets, and a vintage slide buckle. Now to punch holes. Uh, truth time, I usually have my husband do the leather hole punching when I start to struggle like this. But you know, he's at work feeding our family, putting a roof over our heads, and I'm struggling with a hole punch. So problem solving. I punched a set of smaller holes first and punched a series of progressively larger holes until I reached the size I actually needed for the screw rivets. Ta-da, it worked, except now I have too many holes spaced too closely together. And this is why we measure twice, punch once. Ultimately though, it just doesn't matter for this belt because whatever holes I made will be covered by the belt. And in the future, I can fix this with smaller rivets. By the way, this is not a functional belt. And by that, I mean, I can't actually like hold my pants up or anything, but it decoratively stays in place okay. Because I used a slide buckle, there's actually nothing holding the belt taut, and I have no idea how slide buckles work. I tried to Google, but came up with no helpful answers. If any of you know the correct way to put together a belt with a slide buckle, please, please let me know in the comments. And here we've got the finished dress. A little twirl here, a little spin there, a little whatever. Thanks husband for taking this video. Thank you all for being here. If you enjoyed this video and wanna see more, the best way to support me in that is to give this video a thumbs up, um, hit that subscribe button. If you have any questions or suggestions for a future video, let me know in the comments or get in touch via Instagram. My handle is Saki Jane.